I first came to America, I went to a tiny little town called Mount Olive in Mount Olive, North Carolina. If you like pickles, you've heard of Mount Olive Pickles. Couldn't speak English, didn't have any money. So the school accepted me. It was a junior college. I was very grateful that they accepted me. I wondered for many, many years, why would they accept a guy? No money, no English, couldn't pass an SAT, etc. It took me years to figure out Mount Olive, then junior college, is a Baptist school, and I'm sure the director of admissions must have thought to himself or herself, this boy comes from the Holy Land, we have to accept him, what if he's the Messiah? <laughs> so I finished two years, I worked 10 hours a day, I finished two years, and um, I was going to buy a car, I didn't have a car then. I had saved $375, the cheapest car I could find that operated was $750. So I said, it's okay. You just save some money and I'll do it someday. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no such things as unrealistic dreams. No such thing. They're only unrealistic timelines. You can bring your dreams to life. It just might not be done exactly on your time schedule. You may have to be a little more patient than you anticipated. So I said, it's okay. So I went back and told Miss Lohan. Miss Lohan was my house mother. Miss Lohan made $100 a month from Social Security and $100 a month from the school to be a house mother. And I told her I tried to buy a car, you know, et cetera. I told her for no other reason. She had no financial means. I would just, you know, someone to talk with, someone to give you some love. At the end of the month, I got my little statement from the bank. I looked at the bottom, the balance, and it said that I had $750. I can literally remember standing on the campus thinking to myself, I love this country. The bankers don't know how to add. And then it dawned on me, could she? Would she? Did she? This woman making $100 from Social Security? $100 from college? Her words left an indelible impression on my life. I've decided it's better for me to invest my money in the life of a budding young man than to park it in a savings account somewhere. Nido Kubain is a successful businessman, speaker, consultant, and educator. He's been delivering dynamic presentations for over 30 years to such leading companies as AT&T, Domino's Pizza, J.C. Penney, and Radio Shack. He's the author of more than a dozen books, including Stairway to Success and How to Be a Great Communicator. Enjoy this excerpt of Nido's presentation, How to Get Anything You Want. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. What a pleasure and a privilege to be in the midst of men and women who seek to have both success and significance. So there are two pains in life you and I are gonna suffer from, like it or not. One is the pain of discipline, one is the pain of regret. Those men and women who are disciplined in their life, who set their goals, who define them, who work them tenaciously and with great commitment, tend to achieve marvelous things and others marvel at their achievements with both respect and a sense of dignity. My good friend, Dr. Nita Cobain, how are you today? I'm doing great, Nick, good to see you. So I love starting at the beginning, of course, because I find that where people came from, but not only that, how they responded to it dictates a lot of where they go in life. So let's start from where you began. I'm of Lebanese Jordanian background. My father was Jordanian, my mother was of Lebanese descent. My father died when I was six years of age. My mother brought us up. My mother had fourth grade education. There were five of us, three boys, two girls. And uh, she taught me some of the greatest lessons I've ever learned. In fact, my life is so based on so much 
of this faithful woman's teachings. As she worked day and night to feed us, to clothe us, the basics of life, my father had left her with debt and issues and problems, no money. And she was determined that she would make something of her children. And so I am a product of this woman's tenacity and hard work and determination. A woman who believed that um, good things could come to those who work hard enough and smart enough. And uh, I grew up with a mom going to work every day and we lived with meager belongings and conditions. But I never went hungry a single day and my heart and soul were fed every day uh, with concepts like, uh, you know, when God created you, God expects you to be extraordinary because God created us in his own image. You can't be excellent Monday, Wednesday and Friday and take Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday off, that wouldn't make any sense. You're either an excellent person or an ordinary person. Concepts like who you spend time with is who you become. In other words, if you want to be happy, you must hang around happy people. If you want to be rich, find out what poor people do and don't do it. And what you choose is what you get. It's not that difficult, you know, you make choices in life. I like to say the circumstances in which you find yourself do not define where you end up. They only define where you start. And so my mother had two powerful things in her being. One of them is faith and one of them is courage. And if you put the two together, you'd call it faithful courage. And when you have faithful courage, you can attack anything in the world with, with strength and with belief that you can make something happen. Do you remember much from zero to 17 besides your father passing? What was the country like? What was the surroundings like? Of course I remember a lot. I grew up as a Christian, obviously, and I was, uh, went to an Episcopalian church, Anglican Episcopal church. I remembered the love of family and friends. But I also remember at Christmas time, we didn't have a lot. And the Mennonite church in America would send these packages filled with a towel and a pencil and chocolate and a writing pad and all these things that our Sunday school would, would receive as gifts and give to us as kids. And I marveled as a child when I received those little things. And it just left this indelible impression on me that in life sometimes when you do good and you think it's small things that you're doing, but it has impact on others. So I've learned that the two most important words in the English language are these. The influence that you have in life and with people and the impact that you leave behind. Tell me about that time, maybe the, the fear of this country or could you not wait to leave? Tell me about that. Well, my mother uh, insisted that all of us get an education. You have to go to school, get all the education that you have, and prepare yourself for life. And I knew that America represented free enterprise and success. I believe in the American dream. I believe that you and I reside in a fabulous region of the country. We, of course, uh, were as Christians, especially, we're always leaning towards the West and the freedom and all that which it stands for. A nation of over 192 million of all races and many beliefs, divided in many things, our eyes on different goals, and yet essentially together. And uh, all I remember is that when I left for America, she, she had a fever and was sick and was sad to see me go, and probably was a little scared also to see this 17-year-old go so far away. But that's what God intended for life to be, to be challenging, to stretch us, to allow us to grow from within. The zone in which you reside will influence the person that you become. Think of the koi fish. You take a koi fish, put it in a fish bowl, give it all the water you want to give it, all the food you want to give it. The koi fish never grows to more than about two inches in size. Take the koi fish out of the fish bowl and throw it in a lake somewhere, and what happens to the koi fish? It grows to about a foot in size. Moral of the story simply is the koi fish grows proportionately to the environment in which it resides. No different than you and me. Now, when the koi fish sat in that little fish ball, somebody was giving it water, somebody was giving it food. It was easy life, you might say. There was no threat to its existence. But the moment that you put the koi fish into that lake, there are other fish in the lake. 
And they have one thing on their mind, how quickly can I devour the koi fish? So the lake is deeper, and therefore the water is colder, and therefore the koi fish had no choice but to become stronger, to survive and thrive. No difference than you and me. I love that. Now, uh, as you started at school, you, you didn't speak any English, a little bit of English? No, I spoke some English. I spoke some English, yes. And how did you learn? You obviously now have a mastery of language. How did you learn that? So I grew up with this enormous adversity and came to this country at age 17 with $50 in my pocket. On the other hand, I had the greatest uh, that wealth could offer someone, which is a heart filled with hope, a soul that was overflowing with faithful courage. I went to a small school called Mount Olive Junior College then. It was a two-year school. Of course, of Eastern North Carolina. Loved it, loved the people. I uh, couldn't really understand what they were saying. Not only it was English, but it was, it was English with a Southern accent. And so I had to learn it though slowly and cumulatively. And so I was determined that if I'm gonna live in this country, I'm gonna speak the English language in a fluent, fluid, and flowing manner. And I learned 10 English words every day on three by five cards. And today I would learn 10 English words, spelling and meaning, I'm an excellent speller. My syntax is really good. I write very well. Those things don't come to you unless you lose yourself in the purpose of getting there. You have to want it well enough to pursue excellence in life and anything. And part of that is curiosity. Always being curious. How do I learn more? Who do I hang around with? How do I pick the right friends? What are the right books I want to see? What are the right shows I want to learn from? I want to learn from people who have traveled life, have experienced many experiences, who have a sense of wisdom, therefore, and where I could benefit from them, interpret them, and identify them in ways that I could use them for the good. So I'm an eternal student. and everything that I do, I want to learn more, be more, do more, give more, serve more. So I ended up in Mount Olive, and uh, I learned English on three by five cards. And someone asked me one day and said, what was the very first word on the very first card? What did you write down on the very first card? What was the very first word? I said, well, you've asked me an honest question. I must give you an honest answer. This is the truth. This is the honest answer. I swear to you, the very first word on the very first card was the word dumbass. <laughs> now, I did not know what the word meant. I just heard it repeated 30, 40 times every day. And I thought to myself, if I want to live in this country and succeed, I must learn this word. It took me years to figure out that is in fact the most important word in the English language because when you call someone a dumbass, nobody goes, what do you mean? It's crystal clarity about what that means. So I finished two years. Mount Olive it was a junior college. It was two years. So by the end of the second year, I had to transfer somewhere. And, uh, you know, you're living on the campus. And then you're about to go on a three-month holiday. You have no home to go to, no family to go to. Um, what do you do? So I asked the librarian, and, and someone suggested summer camps. What a brilliant idea. I can go work in a summer camp as a counselor, sleep, eat and get paid. It's remarkable. One of those summer camps was a camp called Camp Cheerio, which is owned by the High Point YMCA. So I went there, uh, the kids liked me, surprisingly, they liked the accent, I had some creative ideas. I, I started a newspaper for the camp. I started a radio station for the camp. Now looking back, oh, it was so, you know, uh, simple stuff. But, but the students, you know, or campers, they eight, nine, ten year olds, it was marvelous. And so they invited me back. And then when it came time to transfer, they said, well, why don't you come to High Point? It was then High Point College. Why don't you come to High Point College? And didn't matter to me where I went to school, you know, as long as I could make it happen. And so I came to High Point College and um, I got a job in a church on the weekend to work with young people. And during the week I worked with the YMCA in the afternoon after school kids. And the summer I worked at Camp Cheerio. And that's what brought me to High Point in the first place.
Now you have uh, undergraduate degrees as well as a, a master's degree. How did that come about? Well, I, w I went to school undergraduate High Point, and I went to the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Uh, I got degrees in, in business, and then I immediately um, started my business. As a youth director in a church, uh, I needed ideas. I needed books on games and retreat ideas and so on. And I was frustrated I couldn't find them. So I said, I'll just start a company that does that. I'd say $500. And I started a business to distribute leadership materials. And I paid other church leaders and uh, you know school teachers and others uh, $10 an idea. They sent it in, we used their name. And, and we put them in this magazine called Adventures with Youth. Little did I know that in two years, I'd have 68,000 customers in 32 countries. And Nick, I work 17 hours a day, seven days a week. Now today, people want to talk about life, work, balance. I admire that. But let me tell you what I believe. I believe if you want to get something out of life, you got to work hard. You got you to commit yourself. You got to give of yourself. You can't just sit back on the sofa and say, you know, I'd like to get a job that pays me a lot of money, allows me to travel the world. Uh, I don't really want to work more than seven or eight hours a day maximum, uh, f uh, five days a week, preferably three or four days a week. And during the day, I don't want to really work the whole time. I want to work, play on my iPhone and look at my Facebook stuff and take an hour and a half for lunch and so on. All this is fine until you realize that your beliefs lead to your behaviors and your behaviors lead to your results. So eventually, this habituation process develops within us a certain mindset. And this mindset begins to, to help us or hinder us throughout our life without us knowing why. So I've talked to a lot of people who say, I don't know why I can't seem to succeed. I can't seem to do this. I find out very quickly why. Because good habits are hard to develop but they're easy to live with. Bad habits are easy to develop, but they're hard to live with. Was it Aristotle who said, excellence is not an act, it's a habit. So it's all about habituation. Now, I didn't want to work 17 hours a day, seven days a week, all my life. That would not be uh, appropriate or reasonable, but I had to pay my dues. And so that's what I did. I worked 17 hours a day, and the business became very successful, and that's where my speaking and consulting and all that came out of. Sure, we're, we're going to get into that too. Do you remember uh, what it was like maybe when the first moments when you realized that this business idea that you had, it might actually work? I mean, you get start getting orders. How did that work? And back then it was all mail order, right? I mean, no internet, yes. of course. And yes, all there was no, no computers then. This, this, this is not, uh, there was no Amazon on the horizon. We literally printed brochures or catalogs and mailed them bulk mail and waited for this card that you perforated, that you took out and filled out and sent in an order. And I would go to the post office every day with great anticipation. And I'd open up that little mailbox and there were orders I got excited. Later I got a bigger mailbox and then I got a big drawer because we were getting orders like this. But I enjoyed going to the post office and picking those out. Some days it was phenomenal, and some days I made big mistakes. I'll give you an example of a big mistake. I had this brilliant idea of offering a couple of free books. You know, just on the front of the catalog, I said, these two books are yours free. You don't even have to buy anything, they're free. Now, we were mailing to churches and schools and camps, and I thought, surely nobody would send back a postage paid card. I'm gonna pay the postage and just get the free books. Surely people buy something on this catalog. But let me tell you something, about 90% of the cards I got back had nothing on them except if you send me the free box, which would have cost me postage and so on to send out. There was no way on earth I could have fulfilled all these orders. So I went to see my attorney. What exactly is involved here? I said, what are the legal boundaries here? Am I obligated to send these books? He said, no, you're not obligated to send these books because the other party did not, you know, encounter any expense, not even the postage. I was very embarrassed. We learned a great lesson from that, and we learned in the future to say you can get a couple of books with an order, not without an order. So when did I learn that, you know, it's going to be an idea that's going to really work? 
is when my revenues start exceeding my expenses. It's very simple. And then one day, Nick, something amazing happened. My first son is born, and his name is Ramsey. And I'm really excited about his birth and all that. I bought all these chocolates and gave it to all the nurses and came to my office about early in the morning, 7.30 or so. And by 8.15, 8.30, my assistants, I had four uh, administrative assistants sitting in the lobby. I heard him chattering away. And I went out to see what it is. If something is going on. They said, well, there's some guy on the phone wants to buy uh, 250 or 350 of X program, which cost like $195 each. And they said, you know, they're, they're laughing like, who would buy 350 of this? I mean, we've never sold more than one unit at a time. And I said, well, who is this guy? And they said, well, it's somebody from the United States Armed Forces. And I said, well, let me talk to him. I talked to the guy, it was for real. This was the chaplain of the United States Armed Forces wanted to buy these package of products for every single base in the world. We didn't even have that many. We had to go back to print and so on. And so I took that as a sign from the heavens that the birth of my first son brought a blessing. And I went home that night and I told my wife, we have to give all this money to our church. That we, we can't keep this money. This is just a blessing. And we started a, a fund in my mother's name at, at my church, which today has a lot more money, but we started with that money that came from the, from the U.S. government. And, you know, I've had all kinds of blessings come my way. Uh, but I've always lived by one very simple mantra, which is I invest one-third of my time and energy in earning, one-third of my time and energy in learning, and one-third of my time and energy in serving. And that has been a formula that has been fabulous for me. When did you get your first call or request about speaking? Well, when I started this company and started selling these leadership materials, the, the people who were buying them wanted me to come and do leadership seminars. And before I knew it, I was doing one every weekend somewhere around the country. His speaking topics are relevant to your organization, and his rare insights can be put to work immediately. He presents valuable, customized perspectives on leadership, sales, positioning, and communications. Now, my mother has fourth grade education. I put that woman against 25 PhDs from the finest Ivy League schools of your own picking. Here's why. This woman with fourth grade education had a postgraduate degree in a discipline you and I would call common sense. Someone said, you know the trouble with common sense? It ain't as common as it once was. And then Speakers Bureau in Atlanta, Georgia, called Dupree Jordan, had a Speakers Showcase. This is before anybody ever thought about a Speakers Showcase. And, and somehow I found out about it and I went. And you do this 10, 15 minute you know, deal. And somebody liked me. And that's where I met Zig Ziglar and Cabot Robert and some of the greats at that time of speaking. They were 35 years older than me, but they were all there. And out of that, I start getting engagements from Dupree, Georgia. You know, speak of the life of Georgia Insurance Company, and speak of this one and that one. And they would be, you know, Zig and Cavett and others. And there's little old me, you know, the kid on the program. And then the, those people start paying $500 to speak. And then one day, a guy called Ben B. Franklin from Topeka, Kansas, was the president of a company called the Executive Clubs. He had a network of about 250 or 300 clubs in every city in the country, small and large. Before it was all said and done, I did 230 of his clubs. Spoke in every town in America. I did one speech, gave the same speech, and perfected my skills of timing. Uh, things like your pitch, your pace, your pause. And so by age 28, I was inducted in the Hall of Fame at National Speakers Association. Didn't even know what that meant. And then, of course, I got into consulting, as you know, in 1980. I discovered that these people who are hiring me to speak in companies, I'd speak for an hour, but I'm not sure what I did. You know, they applauded and they gave me a check and I went home. But influence and impact, I wasn't quite sure about. 
And so uh, that sort of urged me to begin to look at more meaningful ways to serve. Hence, I got into consulting and coaching. And so a couple of guys came to me in the mid-80s and said, why don't we start a bank? And I don't know anything about banking. I can start a bank. Well, they were bankers and they wanted my knowledge of marketing, positioning, branding, uh, people, relationships, and so on. And so they started this bank with American Bank and Trust. Good bills are stacked and strapped in packs of 100. Needless to say, the bank took off. We sold the bank, we tripled our money. I got on the board of this bigger bank and I'm the longest serving director uh, on BB&T board, which is the eighth largest financial institution in America. Out of that came more opportunities. The 90s real estate, and year 2000, Great Harvest Bread Company came along. And in every one of those, I was taking a risk. You take risk out of life, you take opportunity out of life. So with every opportunity embedded in it was a risk. And it was my willingness or my capacity to absorb that risk. And I always follow a very simple system for that. You know, I would always say, what's the best thing that can happen as a result of taking this notion? What is the most likely thing to happen as a result of taking this activity? What is the worst thing that can happen if I were to go down this path? And the way I made a decision was very simply, if the most likely thing to happen got me closer to my goals, and if I was willing to deal with the worst thing that could happen, I'd go along with it. So that's, that's yeah, that's what I did. You know, it's, it's the parable of the talents. You have to invest your time wisely. You have to invest your energy wisely. You have to invest your money wisely. He had no connections and only $50 in his pocket. He learned English on free by five cards. He went on to get his two-year degree, graduate, and come to High Point. And we're excited that you're here. Your university president, Dr. Nito Bank. I mean, like tomorrow, we're the ones from uh, New York and New Jersey and those places where I, you brought this weather with you, I'm telling you. <laughs> it has been Through this uh, amazing ascent and probably some valleys that you know, uh, we don't know all the, all the details because you moved on from them, right? A an old friend came calling, High Point came calling back. Tell me a little bit about uh, your involvement on the board of High Point and how yeah. you became the president here. Well, you know, um, I went to High Point University, undergrad. And later in life, I served on the Board of Trustees of High Point University. And I was the incoming chairman of the Board of Trustees, which is quite an honor for an alum to have. I'd had very few students and declining. We had 370 freshmen. I had 91 acres landlocked. You couldn't grow anywhere. I had about $100 million in deferred maintenance. It was not exactly a thriving place. And the president was retiring. About seven or eight years after I've come to this board, the then president uh, decided he'd like to retire and the board was in a search mode for a new president. The board asked me to chair a search committee. I saw something different for High Point University and that led me to Nito Cobain. That was the farthest thing from my mind, but the trustees sort of worked on me and convinced me that this might be a really good chapter in my life. I wish I had kept the comments of every member, of their enthusiasm, their awe and excitement over the idea. So I said, let me pray about it, think about it, talk to my family about it. And so I took three months that summer uh, to, to do just that. In August, I agreed to do it, provided that every trustee wants me. There's one nay vote, I'm out. And the other condition is I wanted to talk to the faculty first. And so in August, the faculty came back and I came to speak to the faculty and I was honest. I said, I'm not an academic. I have uh, a lot to learn, but I've been in education of sorts all my career. Uh, I'm a business guy. Uh, my skills are in finance and in marketing and in branding and positioning but you have to teach me a lot about the other stuff. 
Now, if you want an academic who has written all kinds of dissertations about this and that, I may not be the guy. And frankly, I don't need to be here. You know, I've got thriving business ventures going on. Uh, but I'm willing to come and serve my alma mater. And I got a standing ovation, and the guy sitting next to me, one of the VPs, he said, I haven't seen a standing ovation from this faculty in 20 years. And so I took that to mean as a really good uh, vote of confidence. And I came to um, High Point University. And we began a journey that has been nothing short of a miracle. Moms and dads, we will take care of your pride and joy. That is a promise. So of the 370 freshmen, we have 1,500 today. The 91 acres, we have 480 acres today. The deferred maintenance is all gone. We've invested $2 billion in this university. And we borrowed less than 6% of it to make it what it is. God at work, my friend. God at work. I'm not great at math, but that, is, that sounds like good, very, very good math uh, for any institution. So you decide to take it. You've spoken to the staff. You've got the vote of confidence. What is the first thing you do? You walk in. You decide what has to change in order to get where you want to be. There are four steps to success. One of them is having a clear vision. I had to have a vision for what we want to do. One of them is having a solid strategy. The third one is using practical systems. And the fourth one is consistent execution. So I gathered all of our team, staff and faculty in our theater, and I said, we need to desperately raise some money. We need to raise $10 million really quickly. And so in the next 60 days, we need to raise $10 million to do some basic stuff, paint some walls and fix some lights. And I came back on the 29th day, and we had another gathering. And I said, we didn't raise $10 million in 60 days, and the 60 days are not over with. But what we did is we raised $20 million in 29 days. And everybody went crazy. And I gave everybody a 10-pound chocolate bar as, as a memento. And people start coming, and we start expanding, and then I had to build. Because if, if you saw these students coming, you have no place for them to live. So you literally had to buy the piece of land, zone the piece of land, hire the architect and the engineer, raise the money for it, and build it, and sometimes do all of that in under 10 months. And for the last 13 and a half years, as you know, this place has just blossomed. So we've achieved so much as an institution, and it's because we, we put a great team, we worked hard, and we applied those four points I'm talking about. And we're always looking at the future. We acknowledge that graduates today, they will be working in jobs that will no longer be apparent in our society five years from now or 10 years from now. So they better have life skills. They better have a capacity to think and to adapt to a world that's moving so fast and changing so rapidly. There's enormous benefits that come from change. There are also enormous repercussions that come when you don't change appropriately. So for me, here's what I believe. I believe that for the timid, change is frightening. For the comfortable, change is threatening. But for the confident, change is opportunity. Now the question is, where does confidence come from? It can only come from one place. There is absolutely no substitute for this one place. Confidence always comes from competence. A competent person is therefore a confident person. Where does competence come from? Just what you do at these meetings and other meetings throughout the year. It comes from knowledge and skill and experience. When you have knowledge and skill and experience, and when you frame all that with a, with a commitment to never stop improving, all of a sudden you are confident on merit and by design, not by default. And so yes, it's been a magnificent journey. Honestly, Nick, I did not think I would be here this long. I thought a couple of years. Here I am, my 14th year, loving every minute of it, working hard every day to take this university even further and further and further. 
this university has become sort of a life lab that you've built to prepare these students, so much so that you spend time with them what in their first semester and their last semester. Tell us a little bit about what you impart with them, as well as some of the unique things you've done around here, like the restaurant and other things to prepare them. Well, you know, again, experiential learning is at the heart of who we are and what we do. So I don't believe in just having crusades aimed at people. I believe in having partnerships with them. And so therefore, uh, we have to create an environment in which, through which, by which a person chooses to be extraordinary. Not that you force it upon them, that they make a choice. I want to be an extraordinary human being. So how do you do that? We do it in many, many ways. Some examples. What good is it to go to school and graduate and not know how to get along with people? Have no real ability to write a decent letter, to look someone eyeball to eyeball. It's not how much information you have. It's your capacity to use that information in good ways to build bridges of understanding with other people. When you're a freshman at High Point, you take my course, the President's Seminar on Life Skills. If I could say this with, with some degree of, of, of immodesty, they love my class because it's all experiential. So today we're gonna to learn about how to communicate, how to make sure that people look at you and know you are a person of relevance, and mostly how you develop stewardship, that too much is given, much is required. We have, for example, success coaches. Every student is assigned to a success coach. They guide them from the freshman year to the senior year. We have physical places on campus that enable you to learn amazing things for life and living. Um, one of them is a restaurant. We have a very elegant restaurant. You can get whatever you want and it's free. However, you have to dress up, you have to make reservations, you stand up your reservations, you're thrown out of the system for a month, uh, you can't take your iPhone with you, and you have to be open to receiving um, education and advice about how to eat. It's amazing the number of people who misuse utensils. And then the left-hand side of the menu changes every month with a different country. This month happens to be India. And you learn something about India. We might have a speaker every night about India. The idea is the world in which these students are gonna survive and thrive is different than the world uh, that I experienced when I was their age. They have no choice but to be international in their thinking. This is one of the places doing the essential work of preparing kids to run this country in a competitive world. Which meant we had to create wow moments. Those virtues, or values as High Point calls them, are posted all around campus. And things like this kiosk, where students get free drinks, are an effort to reinforce those ideas. So we do so many things like that. We have 65, for example, study abroad programs, countries, you know, all over the world. Our mission, our goal, is to create global citizens. And so these are some of the benefits that employers are looking for. Time management, budget management skills, cross-cultural communication skills are huge. I went on a May semester to Japan, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. We learned about the culture, the food, the people, the language. I really feel like I came out of that with a lot of growth. Training alone will not get you where you want to get in life. When you train somebody, you show them the how. When you educate someone, you teach them the why. The person who knows the how may always have a job, but the person who knows the why will always be the boss. Given the headwinds that exist generally in higher education, uh, can there be more High Point University? Of course there can be, but, but there really is. You know, your, your question gives us too much credit. The truth is, there are amazing institutions in the Carolinas, and, and we honor every one of them, and we all learn from each other. But High Point perhaps exited an ocean of sameness in many ways entered a, a little lake of differentiation and is working very hard to swim in a little pool of distinction. And that is an everyday commitment that must be tenaciously repeated with all the energy and the effort that one can muster. We, we, we almost need a Nito Quibain uh, uh, English to uh, metaphoric dictionary. I, I just love the way you take those and, and run with those. Ben, go ahead. You've become a hero to many. You've yeah. now written so many books and spoken to millions of people and 
I mean, uh, affected the lives of so many students here. You've won some amazing awards too. Tell us some that, that have meant the most to you. Well, you know, um, look, Nick, if I've helped one person in my life and that one person did wonderful things with it, I'm satisfied. I know. I've always approached my speaking that way. I spoke to an audience of a thousand. Thank you I was trying much. to reach that one person. Because if that one person walks away from there and does something meaningful as a result of what I said, I'm satisfied. Now, as far as awards, one of them is the Horatio Alger Association for Distinguished Americans. Coming from adversity and finding abundance and then channeling that abundance to help other young people to do good things in their life. There are only 280 living Horatio Alger members, people like Colin Powell or Oprah Winfrey or Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, people of that ilk. How I got in there, I don't know, but by the grace of God and the help of others. Another one is the Ellis Island uh, Medal of Honor. That just represents patriotism, how I came to this country as an immigrant, and I was afforded the opportunities to to do something worthwhile with my life. You know, when you think about life and you think about the journey that you travel down this runway of life, you're really blessed if you can appreciate all the steps of life, if you can appreciate the good times and the tough times. Today, I'm in good times, right? But it wasn't always this way. I was leaving Mount Olive and to come to High Point. And the president of the school came up to me and said to me, he said, Nito, I know that you think you've paid your way through school. In fact, there was a chasm between the money you paid the school and the money that you owed the school. And he said, now that you're leaving us, you might just like to know that a doctor in a neighboring city called Goldsboro picked up the tab for the difference. You know, I don't believe giving back is where we ought to be focused. Giving back is like you owe somebody something and you have to pay it back. So if you borrow money from the bank, they expect you to pay it back. That's a duty. So to me, life is not about giving back. Life is about giving, just giving. He said, this doctor wishes to remain anonymous. Now, dear friends, on this morning at this Hyatt Hotel in the city named New York, I ask you this question. What would you have done? I went back to my dorm, knelt by the side of my bed, cried my eyes out. And on that day, I made a commitment to God Almighty that as soon as I begin to work, I too will do something to help kids go to college. And in my first year of business, Swanson dinners and all, I took the first $500. We gave it to a scholarship. Since then, I'm blessed to tell you We've given millions of dollars in scholarships. Giving, not giving back, but giving. And that's what I mean when I talk about serving and making the world a better place and being all that God intended for you to be, being a disciple in every sense of the word. That's what I mean. For me, my father died when I was six. I grew up without a dad. Turning point. My mother chose to send me to America. One way ticket, by the way. Turning point. Miss Lohan, the woman with no money, invested her hard-earned money, my life. Turning point. What are your turning points? It's not always smooth sailing. The best of highways have potholes in them sometimes. It isn't whether we're going to have potholes. It's whether or not we have mastered the art and the science of going around them, about them, under them over them. So what really matters in life is the influence and the impact. That's what matters. Otherwise, what is success? The boy in the mountains of North Carolina walked up to a very wise man, asked him this question. He said, right here in the palms of my own two hands, I have a tiny little bird. You tell me, sir, is this bird alive or is it dead? The wise man thought, and he thought some more. My boy, he said, if I were to say to you that that bird in your hand is alive, I know exactly what you're gonna do. You're gonna crush it. It will be dead. If I were to say to you that that bird in your hand is dead, 
You know exactly what you're going to do. Ever so quietly, you're going to separate the palms of your own two hands. That bird will fly away in total freedom. You see, my boy, the wise man said, in the palms of your own two hands, you hold the power of life or death. Power to your happiness, the power to your sense of significance, the power to your future. Who you spend time with, what you choose, how you change. You hold the power in your own two hands.